Hello, I'm Tom Keneally, and I'm here with my little old book, The Dickens Boy, uh, which is based on the fact that two of Dickens' sons came to Australia. And why would you write about that? Well, they were both far less accomplished and bright than their father. They both had learning difficulties, uh, and they were both supposed to become robust Anglo-Australians and bring colonial glory to the name of Dickens. They had not been very successful at school and Plorn, the younger, Plorn was the nickname his father gave him when he was little. Dickens loved his kids when they were little, but when they grew older and much dumber, he wasn't as... Uh, attentive. When I say dumber, I mean they, they had learning difficulties. They weren't lacking in intelligence and he did realise that and so he often planned a colonial future for them. Two of his sons went to India, for example. Two of his sons uh, to Australia. Plorn began working on a station out, out beyond Wilcannia in New South Wales, in the extreme west of New South Wales, when he was uh, still 16 and it was 1868. He didn't know it, it was two years before his father died. And his entire purpose in life was to redeem himself or as... Uh, Dickens uh, put it, find his groove. Now, Dickens had been frustrated by the poor quality of the academic life of most of his sons. And uh, this uh, was precisely what the colonies were for, to give bluff, genial Englishmen uh, like his uh, unaccomplished sons a run to give them opportunity and to allow them to find the true half of their soul in the netherworld, in the new country, in the colonies, and thus bring glory uh, at a colonial level on the Dickens name. So young Plorn presents himself at Mumba Station west of Wilcannia when he's 16. He's already made the great journey on a sailing ship, in his case, uh, from uh, England. Uh, he gets to Wilcannia by the river steamer and before that by coach and on horseback himself. And he encounters the huge uh, agricultural parcel industry of the day. He, he goes to work on a property of 2,317 square miles, and it belongs to a fascinating Englishman called Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie is, uh, Fred Bonnie is a little man. He is uh, very enlightened, uh, phenomenally enlightened. Uh, I feared that people would make up, uh, would think I'd made up how enlightened he is about the Parkinji, the Aboriginals of the river, uh, and he uh, has a great uh, township of them living for protection near him, and many of them work in his pastoral business. And he tries to stop the uh, mounted police of three states massacring the parking team and entering without authorization onto his station. And so Dickens became aware. Uh, when he was just a little fellow, just a teenager, that uh, Aboriginals were people to be protected, uh, that uh, the various mounted polices which took vengeance on Aboriginals for wrongs they did elsewhere had to be tempered in their enthusiasm, to say the, to say the least of it. And uh, Fred Bonney was also a, an early photographer of both Aboriginals and other people and, above all, places in 
Western New South Wales. He made his own chemical plates and he developed his own film and he is extraordinary for having taken some of the earliest pictures of the Parkinji people, uh, the tribe uh, on Momba. When uh, young Dickens started there, he had to become accustomed to Australian ways through shearing, through above all mustering, through shearing. He had to encounter the men who lived on the huge paddocks in this huge station. Uh, the paddocks were 30 or 40 miles across. They were fenced, heroic business of fencing, I've got to say. I'm glad I wasn't the fencing contractor. And they could die first just crossing their paddock. And so uh, they stayed out there remotely located in huts and they looked after the fences and the flocks and they brought in the flocks at shearing time. And the rest of the year, they were largely on their own. It was a place for eccentrics. It was a place for former convicts. It was the place for fallen gentlemen who were trying to escape their British families. It was um, a, a place generally for recluses and some very eccentric humans. When the Dickens boy is... Uh, comes through his 16th year, approaches the 17th, comes through the 17th. He becomes uh, increasingly aware of the Aboriginal and police versus police problem. There were still Aboriginals then who hadn't, as they say, come in, hadn't come into the reservations, hadn't come into the missions, hadn't come in to the stations. And uh, they were often targets of mounted police. And uh, Dickens, part of his maturing, part of his maturing tragedy that he undergoes uh, is um, results from an attempt from Queensland police to come over the border and go raiding and punishing and revenging crimes committed in Queensland in northern New South Wales. But he also lives with the fact that his wife has left his mother. I'm sorry. His father has left his mother. That he is um, the son of a divided family. He loves his mother. He adores his father. Uh, Dickens was a man who tended to be adored. And he would put on great events uh, over Christmas. Uh, plays in which the kids would act place to which audiences would, uh, would be invited. He would even invite the locals in to watch a night of charades uh, at the Dickens house. And so he was a big figure. He had a showman's temperament. And yet he had separated from their mother when he was, uh, uh, after 10 children, uh, he had said to her that they were criminally unsuited. He had published that opinion in the press. Uh, he was in love with an Irish actress, Ellen uh, Tiernan, Nellie Tiernan. Uh, and they were dealing with that uh, throughout the entire book too. So they're dealing with the history of the Dickens, the domestic history. They're dealing with the history of their father's luster as one of the greatest Englishmen who ever drew breath. They're dealing with the fact that many colonials can recite paragraphs of their father's work and they're not as familiar with it themselves. They are dealing with the struggle to be an illustrious father's dumb sons and to find a place for them in Australia. And they're not as dumb as all that when it comes down to it. And so I'd let, uh, in this book, the Dickens boy redeem himself and meet a nice teenage girl who knows shorthand and who will soon, uh, in, later in the century, become a typist, that modern thing. I hope one day you read the Dickens boy and you uh, enjoy it. And good luck with your isolation.